Well, good morning and welcome back to Community Bible Church. I can't tell you how wonderful, absolutely wonderful it is to have uh, church people in the benches and uh, faces to, uh, to see and to respond to as we worship together. Thank you, of course, for joining us via the live stream over the last couple of weeks and being understanding and needing to respond to COVID in kind of a variety of different ways. Um, thank you for all of that, but of course also thank you for being here this morning. And for those of you who are joining us through the live stream, God bless you. Thank you for being faithful to attend church um, through that uh, method. And uh, we welcome you here this morning as well. Well, there are a number of announcements that we need to go over. Um, let me get a couple of little ones out of the way. First of all, we are going to receive communion at the end of the service here this morning. So if you haven't already picked up your communion kit, please uh, head over there to the back and grab one of those in the center aisle. We would appreciate that. And then also there are um, just two, well, I should also mention this. There are treasurer's reports for the first quarter of the year on the literature table, as well as um, calendars for the month of May. If you would like to pick those up, uh, you certainly may do so. And then two uh, primary announcements. Uh, tonight there is a members meeting, a quarterly business meeting tonight at 6 p.m. And we are going to be considering three uh, significant votes. Um, so please review your bulletin. If you are a member, you have received a link to an online slideshow that walks you through the decisions that are going to meet, be made tonight. And I want to encourage you to please Review that in advance so that things can go smoothly tonight, but we will be considering a sign by the road for the church. We'll be considering painting the gym and the, the beginnings of a landscape project, which includes uh, a poured border for the primary front of church landscaping. We'll be voting on those things tonight, and I want to encourage you to be as well prepared as you possibly can for that. And then I should also mention that... Next Sunday, next Sunday morning is a special missions Sunday. We will be having our missionaries, John and Marissa Sharball, with us. They especially focus on ministry to international students on college campuses. They started actually out in Iowa and over the last 12 months have transitioned. They are both or they are from uh, Indianapolis area. And so they have transitioned back to working at the IUPUI campus in Indianapolis, and they are going to be reporting and sharing their ministry with us, both in Adult Bible Fellowship, so that will be a little more informal time. I want to encourage you to come. Uh, be, there will be some time for question and answer with them during that time, and then John will be preaching for our main service on next Sunday morning. I should also just kind of mention a couple of little details related to that. First of all, Today we are having communion and we would normally have a benevolence offering, but instead we are going to delay that offering and it will be a love offering for the Sharbaugh family next week. And just because of this transition that they've gone through, they have lost some of their financial monthly support. And I know that if we were to give generously to them in this love offering, it would meet a, a very specific need in their lives. So I want to encourage you to kind of pray about giving in that love offering next week. And then finally, as an additional opportunity to just be with them a little bit and fellowship with them a little bit longer, we're going to have a potluck after the service next Sunday morning. And those who stay, families who stay or individuals who stay, need to bring something to share. Families need to bring two things, a main dish and either a side or a dessert. Probably just a dessert would be good enough as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so if you have any questions about that, let me know afterwards or, of course, just check the bulletin. This is the Lord's Day, and it is our great privilege and responsibility on this day to worship Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords, and it is a privilege to do that together, isn't it? Let's bow our heads for a, a quiet moment of reflection, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we just humbly come before you this day, and we dedicate our hearts and attention to you. We ask, O oh God, that you would speak to us through your word, that we would be responsive to you in prayer and faith and obedience and love for you and love for one another. 
I pray that you also would give us a heart for the community around us. Help us to reach out with acts of kindness and words of encouragement and to share the gospel, O Lord, the story of the Lord Jesus Christ who has died for our sins and redeemed us. Lord, I pray, O God, that you would give us a heart to share that message with the world around us. We ask this in your name. Amen. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning for scripture reading. It's going to be a responsive reading. So I will read the first several slides, and then we'll come to a slide that is italicized. And I want to ask you to read aloud with me. I think it's a total of three italicized slides that you will join with me for that reading. So um, turn your attention to the screen here and stand with me as we read aloud from Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and, a golden, and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Join with me. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people from God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing, and honor, and glory, and might, forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Please remain standing as we sing together. We're going to begin with, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
Thank you. You may be seated. Just a reminder that the offering plates are still in back, or you can still give online at the church website if that's how you choose to do so. Scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom I shall be afraid. When evil lures assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all my days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon the rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer his tent sacrifices without joy, with joy, shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O oh, you have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not. O oh, God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. And lead me on a path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray. O oh, Father, give us the courage to be emboldened, to do your work, to expand your church, to tell others about you, but let us also lean on you for guidance, wisdom, strength, and understanding, so that what we do is not on our accord, but on your accord, Lord. Help us look to you for guidance, and we ask that you be with us throughout the days of our lives, that ultimately we will be with you, that we'll have won fought the good fight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
We invite you to stand with us as we sing together, Hallelujah, my Redeemer. Love me first, I would 
Let's join in prayer together. Oh, Father, we want to thank you that we're back here together after a couple weeks apart, that we're able to worship together, to fellowship with one another. This time off, we also want to thank you for the technology we've had. Um, up until a few years ago, we wouldn't have been able to stay connected or to still worship, through, whether it be through phone, connection through email, or the online worship service, Lord. These uh, tools that you have given us have been able, able to us continue on, Lord, and uh, for that we thank you. And although we are able to continue on, Lord, we pray for the church as a whole. We pray for our country as a whole. Because Christianity is down. Church membership throughout the country is down, Lord. We pray for all those people who do not yet know you or know of you but haven't made a commitment to you, Lord. We pray that you will bring them into the fold, Lord. We want to take this time to also ask you to watch over the next hour. Ask you to watch over Pastor Rodney. Give him words to speak. That the words will be from you, Lord. That they will touch our heart and enlighten us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, boys and girls, second grade and down, you can be dismissed to go to your class. Thank you for being with us so far in our worship time. And for the rest of us, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. When our boys were little, um, one of their favorite entertainment videos was a little series of films called Frog and Toad. And there was, they're based on some books as well, Frog and Toad are Friends, and there's several of them. Um, and these were a version of old-fashioned claymation movies, right, where they uh, made, the, made them out of, they, originally they were made out of clay and then eventually out of some kind of polymer or something like that. And at the end of one of the films, there was a documentary about how they made the film that had just been made. And when it comes to making claymation, what a slow process. My goodness. Very, very slow process. So the way they would do it was they would set up this whole scene, right? And they, they had it up on like sawhorses so that they didn't have to bend over all the time, right? Um, it wasn't on the floor. It was up. And they would set up these scenes with the figurines and the backdrop and the, the buildings and everything that was involved. And they would get it all set, and they would take two shots with a 35-millimeter camera. And then they would go in with something that looked a little bit like a tongue depressor and a ruler, and they would measure the minutest little change in position of one of their mouths for making words, right, or for... Uh, one of their arms or legs or whatever. And then they would stop and take two more shots with the 35 millimeter camera. And then they would go in and measure and do that whole thing again and again and again and again. And then they would take that to the lab. And of course, those of you who know about um, film films, right? They take all of those individual shots and they turn them into a string of action film, right? They put them all together. And at the end of one day, a long day, many hours of shooting, right, these individual shots, they had between, they had 15 or 16 seconds, <laughs> 15 or 16 seconds worth of film. So no wonder they were kind of short, right, because of all of this laborious thing. Well, the, the book of Hebrews kind of does something similar to that. The book of Hebrews zeroes in, out of all of the history of the Old Testament, the book of Hebrews in chapter number 11, zeroes in and takes a very precise, highly measured kind of close-up of faith. There were certainly plenty of other people of faith in the Old Testament, but these specific examples, they give us these close-up shots that are very precise to help strengthen and encourage our faith. So I'm going to read 
a little bit of context for our specific text this morning. So there is an outline in the bulletin this morning, if you want to use that in following along. And we are going to focus on Hebrews 11, verses 5 and 6. However, um, we're going to read, to begin with, verses 4 down to verse number 7. So a couple of extra verses because of one specific thing that I need to point out. So Hebrews 11, beginning in verse number 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. That was last week's message about the faith of Abel. And now today, the faith of Enoch, verse number 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Verse number 7, now transitioning to another one of these highly measured, precise little snapshots. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen... In reverent fear, constructed an ark by sa for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. And so the one thing that I kind of want to point out from the context, from the broader picture, like as if we were zooming out on the camera here, is I want to point out this progression that happens in verses 4 to 7. So what, what was... Uh, Abel. In many ways, he is commended because he offered up an acceptable sacrifice, an acceptable offering to God. So he was a worshiper. His uh, faith is expressed in his worship, worshiping obediently to the Lord. Enoch, Enoch walked with God. Now, I know that it doesn't say that in verses 5 and 6, but that's very clear in the record of Enoch back in Genesis. And we're actually going to reference that from Genesis chapter 5 here in a little bit. But Enoch walked with God by faith. So we have Abel who worshipped God by faith. We have Enoch who walked with God by faith. And then we have Noah down in verse number 7 who built an ark. He worked for God by faith. And that is an important progression to point out, by the way, that we need to make sure that our hearts are worshipping and in our lives we are walking with God before we just take up the work of God. It's important that we have spiritual habits of walking with him, that we have a heart of worship, because sometimes service can overwhelm us if we are not walking with God by faith. And then something else that I want to just kind of zero in on, kind of bringing our camera down in for a little bit of a close-up on verses 5 and 6, we have this record, this illustration of Enoch, who um, walked with God by faith. We'll see that in Genesis chapter 5 in a moment. And then he was taken up um, by God. And so th the theme of verses 5 and 6, our specific text for today, is that we fellowship with God, we fellowship with God by faith. We fellowship with him by faith. So um, the book of Hebrews is very much about endurance. God did not want the believers in that the book of Hebrews is written to, these Jewish Hebrew believers, he did not want them to give up. He wanted, some of the phrases that are there are, do not cast off your faith, hold fast, persevere. These are some of the primary themes of the book of Hebrews. They were being tempted to give up both on Christian fellowship, Christian faith, and Christian worship because of the persecution that was pressuring them. And so there is this repeated theme in the book of Hebrews of persevere, hold on, hold fast, endure, have an enduring faith. However, these verses with the illustration of Enoch remind us that it's not that Christianity, that the Christian life is not just sort of holding on by your fingernails, white knuckle like Christianity, persevere, persevere, persevere. That's not all of it. Christianity requires perseverance, but nevertheless, that's not all of it because there is the rich reward of fellowship with God. This is a verse, or these are verses that are about friendship. 
that are, that are about walking with God, that are about fellowshipping with the living God. So it's, it's not just endurance and perseverance in the book of Hebrews and in the Christian life. There's also this rich reward of fellowshipping with God by faith. Now, as I mentioned, there's an outline in your bulletin, and um, I know that that outline looks like this is going to be a really long sermon, but we're going to try not to overdo things. But there are seven points to be made about fellowship with God from these two verses. So I want to just read verses 5 and 6 again, and then we'll dive in with point number 1. So again, zeroing in with a close-up on Enoch and his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him up. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Verse number 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So, point number one, fellowship with God equals walking with him. Fellowship with God equals walking with him. And we really need to turn to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 5, to see this more clearly. Part of the story of Enoch that is not included in the little synopsis in Hebrews chapter 11 is this statement that Enoch walked with God. So Genesis chapter 5, and we want to look at these specific verses, verses 21 through 24. Genesis 5, 21 through 24. This, many of you know that chapter 5, Genesis chapter 5 is just all of these hard to pronounce names, name after name after name after name, and they lived so many years and they had sons and daughters, and then they lived more years and they died, right? It was, it's kind of a chapter of death, really, in the progression of the book of Genesis. And so um, this is the record of Enoch, verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and, after, and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So um, <clears throat> we're going to tease out some more about that. I mean, I know that that's a very unusual passage of Scripture, and there are some things that perhaps need to be explained and some things that maybe we'll have to say for another time. But nevertheless, um, this key verse that he walked with God. I want us to just think for a moment that, that walking with God is the perfect analogy, the perfect analogy for fellowshipping with the Lord, for fellowshipping with God. So think about this. When you walk with someone, you have the same purpose and same destination. I remember that I was at a conference one time. Uh, with a very famous speaker, a very famous preacher, John Piper was there. And it was kind of interesting because I was going down an escalator in this big city conference center, and here he was coming up. And it was so interesting to watch because somebody was waiting for him at the top of the escalator, like, I'm going to talk to John Piper, right? This is going to be uh, something to, to live to tell about. And, but John Piper was in a hurry, as you know, it's kind of understandable. Um, he had various speaking responsibilities and um, had designated some time for personal ministry, but also had other times when he needed to be preparing or doing something else. And so what did he say when he gets to, he saw the guy waiting there, right, you know? And, um, and what does he say? I, I heard him as I was going down. He said, walk with me, right? Because if, if you want, and that's another thing about walking with someone, is you have the opportunity for communication, Right? And, and he had somewhere that he was supposed to be, but he was happy to talk and communicate with this gentleman if he would join him to going to the same destination. Right, And so when we walk with God, we have a similarity of purpose. We want his glory. We want his honor. We want the good of people around us. We have the same destination, as it were. We are going to join God in heaven ultimately. And walking with God is an illustration that fellowshipping with God is an illustration of that. And there's also opportunity for communication. Um, I can tell you one thing for sure, that if I'm running, I'm not communicating, <laughs> right? I'm not talking with anybody if I'm running, right? And that's probably true for most of us that are over 30 here, right? We're not going to be carrying on a conversation if we're actually having to run. But walking, we can. We can chat, we can talk, we can pray, to talk to the Lord and communicate with him. So walking gives an opportunity for communication. 
Um, walking is something that is sustainable. That's one of my favorite things about walking is, is, you know, I can walk a long way, so I can't run very far, but I can walk a long ways, right? And <clears throat> it's something that is sustainable. People, um, every one of you walked in here today, right? From little tiny toddlers all the way up to our most elderly church member, right? We, we all walked in here. It's something that we all hope that we will be able to do to the very end of our days, that we will still be able to walk, right? That's something that we hope for. It's something that we learn to do early, and we hope to be able to do until our dying day. Um, walking is something that is sustainable. So that reminds me that walking with God, fellowshipping with God, is not something that's just for super Christians, right? For just for maybe missionaries and pastors and and people who are kind of hyper spiritual. No, <clears throat> walking is not running a marathon. Walking is not even riding a bicycle, right? Walking is not flying. Walking is just walking. And it's something that just the most ordinary people can do. And we can do it for a long ways and for a long time in our lives. So how do we walk with God? How do we walk with God? We need to evaluate our purpose. What direction are we going? If we're going against God's will, we're not walking with Him. We need to communicate. We need to communicate with God, to God in prayer. We need to receive His communication regularly through His Word. And those are things that we should pursue every single day. So I told you, you know, walking is sustainable and it's kind of simple. And so the application is simple, is it not? Communicating with God and following His will. Number two, our fellowship with God is pleasing to Him. Our fellowship with God is pleasing to Him. There's an interesting bit of history in the translation of the Bible that uh, is kind of worth going on into here for just a second from Genesis, and then there's a comparison in Hebrews chapter 11. So Genesis chapter 4, verse, I'm, I'm, far, I'm sorry, chapter 5, verse 24, is the main verse in Genesis 5 for us. Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God had taken him, or God took him. Enoch walked with God. Now, um, <clears throat> theologically, God doesn't have to walk anywhere, right? God is always present everywhere. Theologically, God doesn't have a body. So this is something that theologians call an anthropomorphism. It's giving God characteristics that humans have. We walk, God doesn't walk, right? And so... Theologically, the ancient translators of the Old Testament, when they translated it into Greek, you know, around the New Testament era, before Jesus Christ, but around that same time, um, when they translated it into Greek, they actually changed it. They actually changed it to say, not Enoch walked with God and God took him, but Enoch pleased God. And God took him. He was not for God took him. Um, and, and actually, it's so interesting that if we turn back to Hebrews chapter 11, that's actually what Hebrews 11 says. It says that um, Enoch pleased God. Um, if you look at it um, at the end of verse number 5. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So... It's as if the Holy Spirit kind of endorsed that ancient translation of the even more ancient text. And so what's going on there is, is I think God wants us to come to the very simple conclusion that when people fellowship with God, it is pleasing to Him. That is how we please the Lord. We please Him by fellowshipping with Him. In other words, it's not optional. To walk with God is not optional for a Christian. Maybe an illustration of this would be on our phones, right? We have some apps some applications on our phones that we can live with or without. But your phone will not work without its OS, without its operating system. Walking with God is the Christian day in and day out operating system. Fellowshipping with Him, that is the Christian life. There is no pleasing God without fellowshipping with God. So, Fellowshipping with God equals this idea of walking with Him. Fellowshipping with God is pleasing to God. And then number three, fellowshipping with God prepares us for heaven. One of the things that's kind of going on in this passage in Hebrews chapter 11, and we will spend the rest of our time there, by the way, 
in this passage in Hebrews chapter 11, is there are some words that are repeated sort of again and again. There are some phrases that are repeated. Or there are phrases that kind of get piled up on top of one another to illustrate the importance and the privilege of fellowshipping with God. And one of them is this idea of being taken. Look at verse number 5. It's three times in verse number 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So there is this sort of reality of, man, the book of Hebrews wants us to know that Enoch was taken from earth to heaven. God took him to himself. So Enoch walked with God. Enoch fellowshiped with God on his, during his days here upon the earth. But when he was taken to heaven... When he was taken to the presence of God, he certainly and obviously was closer to God in fellowship than he had ever been on earth before. Right? That's the logical assumption, I think, that Hebrews wants us to understand. Part of the purpose of fellowshipping with God now is so that heaven won't be such a shock to our system. Right? If we are compromising in our Christian life, if we are not pursuing fellowship with God on a regular basis, if our pursuit of holiness is half-hearted, then heaven's going to be a little odd. And in fact, I kind of think that for some Christians, heaven's going to be weird. Because they've kind of skated along in their Christian existence. And we want to be a little more like Enoch. Now, this hasn't happened since the Old Testament, where someone walked with God and was taken up to God directly straight to eternity. That's, that's not happened since the Old Testament. So I'm not expecting to have a news flash, you know, where it says, Tom Foreman of Community Bible Church was taken. He walked with God and was not, for God took him. Right? I'm not expecting that in, for any of us. We're going to, unless the Lord Jesus comes and takes us, right, Unless the Lord Jesus comes and does that, we're going to die. But we should want whatever happens to us in our particular existence, whether the Lord Jesus returns and takes us to himself, or whether we go through a full life, die, and then go to eternity, we should want our transition to glory to be as seamless as possible, right? That, that heaven would not be a shock to us. That heaven would be a joy to us because we have been preparing by fellowshipping with God. What is heaven going to be other than fellowship with him together? We should want our commitment, our obedience, our fellowship with God to be similar to that of what it will be when we are in heaven. And then, so fellowship with God prepares us for heaven. Number four, fellowship with God equals friendship with him. Fellowship with God equals friendship with him. So this now comes from verse number six. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and so on. So whoever would draw near to God. So drawing near to God in indicates closeness. It is nearness, fellowshipping with him. It is actually possible to be close to the Lord. This is a term of relationship. This is a term of friendship. We sometimes use this kind of vocabulary. We might say of, a, of an old friend, we might say, well, I'm not really close to him or that close to him anymore. Or we might say of someone, she is a very close friend. This nearness, um, this closeness is a relationship term. And so drawing near to God, being close to God, experiencing literal friendship with God. In fact, it is spoken of in the Old Testament of Abraham that he was considered a friend of God. This is a term of closeness to him. And in the book of Hebrews, drawing near to God is especially related to prayer. So I am going to have to ask you to maybe turn, <clears throat> turn back a page or or maybe you won't even need to turn a page, to look at Hebrews chapter 10, just really a few verses earlier in the context of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21. 
It says, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so this specifically in this context, because it mentions the priesthood of God and this possibility of drawing near to him with our hearts, it is in reference to prayer. And that I could even go into more details related to the context of that paragraph, but nevertheless, it is related to prayer. And so when it is when we enter into heartfelt, genuine, real prayer, I'm not talking about saying your prayers, but I'm talking about communicating with God. When we enter into genuine, heartfelt, serious prayer that we draw near to Him and we experience the most closeness to Him. So fellowship with God is equivalent to friendship or closeness with God, especially experienced in prayer. And then number five, fellowship with God requires intentional effort. I mean, obviously, especially when it comes to prayer, you don't just accidentally, I mean, sometimes we do accidentally pray, maybe, but you don't just fall into serious, heartfelt, intentional prayer. So fellowship with God requires intentional effort. And we see that in this phrase in verse number six, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him, those who seek him. So seeking God speaks of purpose and pursuit. It is um, by definition, seeking God requires that we seek him, right? That we pursue after him and fellowship with him. So fellowship with God requires intentional effort. You don't accidentally fellowship with God. We must pursue after it. Also, seeking him, this little phrase in verse number six, seeking after God reminds us that we've lost something, haven't we? Because of our sin, we have lost fellowship with God. And whatever it is that anybody in this world is looking for, they're not going to find it. You're not going to find it. I'm not going to find it unless we find it in fellowship with God. Now, part of the power of this passage is just the fact that it keeps piling this stuff up, right? Taken. It reminds us that fellowship with God um, prepares us for heaven. It reminds us that fellowship with God pleases Him. Again and again and again, these, these words and phrases talk to us about the importance of fellowshipping with God. But we can't, for, we can't keep looking at all of the close-ups and forget that Hebrews 11 is about faith, right? It's about faith. So verse number 5, again, remember, by faith Enoch was taken up. And uh, verse number six, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. So we need to also come to the conclusion, number six, that fellowship with God is by faith. Fellowship with God is by faith. So if you think that you're going to sort of put yourself on a regimen, you know, I'm going to pray for 22 minutes every day, and I'm going to read 17 chapters of the Bible every day, if you think that you're going to put yourself onto a regimen and just do certain things to fellowship with God, you're going to fail. Those actions need to be a reflection of believing in God and believing that God is real and specifically here in this passage is a rewarder of those who seek Him. So if it is your idea to just sort of perform certain actions, you will not end up fellowshipping with God. But if your actions are a result of believing in God and a desire for the reward of fellowship with Him, then you will experience that worship. So what he says, and we should just quickly look at verse number 6 again, without faith it is impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must, number one, believe that He exists, we need to believe in the existence of God. And by the way, there are lots of good reasons to believe. There's lots of good evidence for believing that God exists. But you have to believe it. It is still an act of faith to believe in the existence of God. And also must believe that God rewards those who seek Him. Which, and there's a very specific application of that. By the way, if we are not seeking to fellowship with God... It's because we don't really believe that it's worth it. That the reward 
is worth the effort. I would say that the riches of the reward of fellowshipping with God is always, always worth it. Now, number seven, finally, fellowship with God is the reward of faith. Now, I'm not trying to sort of do some doublespeak here, but what I am saying is this. Fellowshipping with God is its own reward. Fellowshipping with God is its own reward. We are hardwired for fellowship. Didn't we find that out during the lockdown? Oh, my goodness. You know, kids are going nuts and crazy because they can't see their friends. Moms and dads are going crazy because, you know, all you see is one another, right? Okay. Um, we are hardwired to be, to not socially distance, right? Okay, we are, we are hardwired that way. We need, you know, some of us need fellowship a little more than others maybe, but nevertheless, we are hardwired to have human contact. God did not... God did not intend for us to all be a bunch of hermits, right? We are hardwired for fellowship, and the deepest and most real fellowship is with God. We are, we are hardwired to seek after fellowship that is divine, fellowship that is with our maker and our creator. And so fellowship with God is its own reward. So I'm not going to ask you to turn to these passages of Scripture. I'm just going to read a couple of these. But these are illustrations where God speaks about, or some saint, some believer speaks about God being their reward. So this is Psalm 73, verse 26. Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart, and God is my portion Forever. The word portion is an illustration of, of a reward that God is giving himself to the psalmist here. That God is saying, I am your portion. Not that you have a portion of land or a portion of food or a portion of wealth. Well, I am your portion. I am what has been provided for you in your life, for your own experience of fellowship and fulfillment. And then God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. This is the verse Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, I will protect you, and your exceeding great reward. I am your exceeding great reward. So I'm going to protect you and I'm going to provide for you. And the ultimate provision for Abram was himself, God himself. Now, God had made a bunch of promises to Abraham, right? A lot of land and a bunch of kids, right? That was his reward. God was his exceeding great reward. So fellowship with God is its own reward. God honors faith by giving us himself. Now the question that this passage asks of us is whether or not we are going to follow up on our hardwired longing for fellowship with our creator and fellowship with God. Are we going to follow up on that? Are we going to perhaps do a course correction and intentionally pursue God in prayer and in his word a bit more? Are we going to uh, seek for what we have lost in him and in him alone? Are we going to seek after God with, with all of our hearts? Will we draw near to him in prayer? Will we long, I mean, I think probably most of us could say, I've, I've sort of needed to preach this sermon to myself this week as well. Most of us could say, I don't some very often maybe feel very close to God. And the question would be, well, how much are we praying? Are we depending upon him in, in real, genuine, honest prayer? Are we going to walk with God in our everyday, day in and day out existence? So, my friends, my church, don't be half-hearted in pursuing after seeking God. Don't be satisfied with careless con Christianity where heaven will be a shock to our system Instead, enter into this 
sort of jewel of a possibility of deep, real, authentic fellowship of walking with God. Let's pray together. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these close-ups of faith in the Bible where we see a snapshot of somebody who's gone before us, not only in perseverance, but in the delightful duty of fellowshipping with you. And Lord, I pray that we would be the kind of people that, that would leave here today just longing for more fellowship with God. That we would kind of pause a little bit this afternoon for some prayer. And that we would confess that our fellowship with you has not been as maybe consistent as it should be. Or as deep as it should be. Or that we have not delighted in it as much as we should. That Lord, you would draw us into a richer, deeper experience of, of fellowship with you. May it be said of us that we are walking with God. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, as we uh, move into our time of receiving communion, we're going to sing together. And so I want to uh, ask you to stand with the worship team as we sing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery, and just uh, rejoice in what God has done for us and that we can receive by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ.
So as we enter into our time of communion, if you need to get a communion kit, you certainly may go ahead and do that. I want to remind us all that this is a time when we remember Christ's death on the cross for our sins, and that if you have not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, it would be better to abstain from this and uh, wait until you have settled in your heart this most important relationship between you and God in trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and in Him and Him alone. Not something that we accomplish, but something that we receive. And of course, in receiving communion, we are remembering our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, on the night that He was betrayed, the Scriptures say that He took bread and that He blessed it and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we are so um, humbled when we truly remember the cross, when we recognize the... Um, the pain of that place, of that experience, but also when we recognize the weight of sin, the crushing weight of sin. And Lord, as Christ's body was broken, He bore the brunt of our sin and Your judgment upon it. He was bruised for our iniquities and for our transgressions. And we are grateful for that plan of redemption. You could have left us in our sins and condemned us all, and yet you gave yourself for our forgiveness. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And then as you open your cup there, we should also remember that at the same, on the same night, the Lord Jesus also took a cup. And the scriptures say that he said, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it all of you. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, once again we are grateful for the sacrifice that bought our redemption, that paid for our forgiveness. And may it be, O oh Lord God, that you would draw us near to yourself as we reflect on this sacrifice. One of the ways in which we can draw near to you, that we can fellowship with you, is just reflecting and remembering the deep sacrifice of our Lord. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as I've already mentioned, um, we will not receive a benevolence offering here today. Instead, any gifts that would ordinarily go into the benevolence offering, we're asking you to save those and, we, and put those in the love offering for next Sunday for John and Marissa Sharbaugh. I also want to mention a, a couple of other things. Uh, as we uh, begin to dismiss this morning. First of all, um, the Sharbaughs are really great missionaries, and I think that every uh, family, every Christian family, ought to support a missionary, kind of adopt a family missionary or individual missionary uh, as your own, and I think they're great candidates for that. And you might kind of think about that a little bit as you're listening to them next week. I also want to just sort of speak specifically not only to us, but to our folks on the live stream. The elders and deacons and I have been planning and praying and preparing for some outdoor services. So we are excitedly looking forward to outdoor services in the month of June. And one of the things that we are praying for is that we can all fellowship and worship together uh, again soon, whether that's outside or inside. But nevertheless, we know that it can work outside. So we're looking forward to seeing everyone together. And we've designated the month of June for those outdoor services. God bless you. Go in the grace of the Lord. You're dismissed.